Hi, and welcome to another episode of What I Wish I'd Known, the Google Partners Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Langsher. I'm really stoked to have as our guest today, Ollie Gardner, co-founder of Unbounce, a must-have tool for anyone that is even thinking about landing page building and testing. Unbounce almost single-handedly created this field, and Ollie travels the world to speak and evangelize about the importance and criticality of focusing deeply on the landing page experience. Ollie is a self-professed zealot who seeks to rid the world of marketing mediocrity. And just how zealous is Ollie? I hear all you all asking. Well, here's a little fun factoid for you. He at one point considered even legally changing his name to Landing Page in order to get that little extra kick of SEO juice from the many bylines in the guest articles that he's written. Clearly, Ollie is a true believer. Welcome to the Google Partners Podcast, Ollie. Thanks for having me on, Alex. It's great to have you here, Ollie. You know, I'd like to start off by just asking if you could share with our listeners your, your backstory. I mean, how did you come to be where you are? How is Unbounce founded? What what what's it about? Sure thing. I actually started as a developer twenty years ago. I was horribly misled at high school. <laughs> um, yeah, I like having that technical background now, though. But uh, yeah. and then over the years, I kind of progressed through kind of from back end coding to front end. Then the web kind of existed. I got into front end web, then usability, interaction design. I was a creative director for a while, but and then worked at a couple of startups. Met some of our six co-founders in different jobs. And then in 2009, we started Unbounce. And day one, that is when I became a marketer because I'd never done it before. Well, before we begin, Ollie, you know, I have a fairly straightforward question for you, but one that I think that will mine a rich vein of dialogue between the two of us. And that is, what makes for a great landing page? Great question. And the, the number one principle is that you should be using one. <laughs> it's, it's kind of ridiculous, the amount of marketers who still aren't. Um, but I think you can think of three simple qualities of a great landing page. First is that it's focused entirely on whatever campaign you're running. So if you're doing paid advertising in particular, you're sending an ad somewhere you shouldn't send it to your website. You should send it to a landing page created specifically for that ad. So the message match is very strong. You know, whatever you're promising in your ad, and that could be in an email as well, anywhere you're promoting something, whatever you have there, the promise, if that is not matched on the landing page, there's a disconnect that can make people think, oh, this isn't for me and leave. So that tight bond is one of the important things as well. And then attention ratios. So the amount of distractions on the page that people that could take people away so attention ratio is the ratio of the number of things you can do to number of things you should be doing and when you're running a campaign there's only one goal so you should have one focus call to action anything else that any navigation that can take you away from the page pollutes that attention ratio makes it worse and can impact conversions in a negative way and then perhaps most importantly of all is clarity that the way we communicate our value proposition if your headline your subhead uh, the main kind of imagery if this doesn't communicate really quickly what you do and why someone should care then you're going to lose out to your competitors when people are doing that kind of fast comparison shopping you know often people just hold it like one of the keyboard keys down control or command or whatever click a whole bunch of ads after a search to open them in tabs and then just quickly flick through them. So if you don't communicate really quickly, like a tie to the, you know, the message match is strong, lack of distractions, and then a very clear value prop, then they'll close that tab and go to the next person. That's kind of how people's impatience runs things these days. And just how impatient are people? Do you have any data that tells us like how quickly they'll leave a bad landing page and, and or any data that demonstrates of those three points, you know, alignment, mm -hmm. attention ratio, and clarity, is any one of them more important than the other if I had to only prioritize one? So there's the message match thing kind of goes hand in hand with the landing page portion of quality score if you're for ads mm -hmm. in particular. Absolutely. Uh, so that can have an impact on how Google ranks your, your page, uh, rates your page in, in that with those factors. Uh, attention ratio wise, we've got a lot of data on that from 
lead gen landing pages in particular. So the more links you have that could take people away from the page, internal navigation, like say you have anchor navigation that brings you down a long page, that's totally fine because it's not taking you away. But when you look at the amount of links that can take you away on a lead gen landing page, we've seen a decline in conversion rate as you add more and more links. And clarity, that's a lot of that comes down to A, that that can you figure it out quickly, someone might leave, but also is it going to help people then stick around and go, oh, I, this is actually sounding pretty good and you know, you'll know you continue down the page. Uh, how impatient are people? Well, increasingly so. Uh, there are There's tons of information out about there that people mm-hmm. <laughs> talk about. You know, ask. We have an attention mm-hmm. span of five seconds, seven yeah, seconds. I mean, I think I Google is now selling that. six and a half second increments on uh, and YouTube, right? Yeah. Right. So page speed is a massive factor in that kind of thing, in the impact on conversion. But in terms of, you know, how long someone's going to stick around, that, honestly, that depends a lot on their motivation, the thing they're trying to achieve, like how high motivation is that thing? If they're trying to apply for citizenship, you're highly motivated. If you're just looking for, you know, cheap yellow bananas or something or, or like yeah. <laughs> stripy t-shirts there's slightly less motivation there so that can impact your level of impatience dependent on what situation. about platform or device i should say i mean do these three things hold true as well from a mobile or a non-mobile experience and i mean putting quality score and uh, issues aside with respect to landing page alignment to mm-hmm. you know ad copy is there a difference between those two device types? That I don't have data on that specifically, but I would imagine so. It's very different. I mean, you don't like open a bunch Correct. of tabs and mm-hmm. flip through them on a phone. Well, thanks, Ali, for indulging me in a little bit of that uh, shop talk there. And let's move on to the premise of the podcast, which is what you wish you'd known. My question to you is simple. What would be the top five strategically tactical actions that you would tell your younger Ali self if he were setting about to build a business and a company and navigate a product into the marketplace today? Yeah, that's a, it's really interesting to think about this type of thing. And, and it's changed over time. We're nine years old now. So my perspective is a little bit different than it would have been four years ago, if you'd asked. But yeah, I think one of the, the things that I've really has, has kind of come home really strong to me recently is that one of the big problems founders suffer from is the ego of the size of your company and headcount is a dangerous metric to be basing your success on because it's it's a real vanity metric i mean you get excited when you're talking with other founders or just general other people in the in the space and and you talk about your company and they say oh how big are you guys now you know what's your how many employees you got and you delight in saying, oh, we're, we're 100 people, we're 175 people now. And that is dangerous. I mean, I, mean, I, I loved it for a portion of time because whenever I talk to my family back at home, I, you know, they'd ask and I'd say, you know, this many people and they'd be blown away because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big achievement. But if you rely on that, it's, it's going to be dangerous because the growth period between 50 or say 70 people and up to 125 or 150 is the most dangerous part of your company's growth. What, why? Initially, because typically you won't have the organizational and managerial structure in place for that growth period because you might have a management layer that's maybe not incredibly experienced because you were a startup, you hired people and you're growing, but they maybe manage one person, two people. As you scale, that lack of experience can come out or it can just be the fact that when you hire so quickly you're constantly training people you have people who should be just doing their work constantly helping other people train them answering questions you're all working on the culture trying to work together it can slow you down and at some point you're just going to see you're getting less done with more people which can hurt some of your business metrics. Uh, so, you know, like revenue per employee. And it can just, it can frustrate people because they're not 
they're not personally getting as much work done as they were before. And this isn't to say that you can't go through this and do it properly and, and succeed doing this if you're, if you're aware. But a lot of startups especially aren't aware of these things when they begin. I mean, we're great friends with Rand Fishkin, uh, who was the yeah. founder of Moz, now Spark Toro. And he yeah. warned us of this, you know, because they're in Seattle, we're Vancouver. We've been friends for a long time. And he warned us of this exact same thing. So we already knew it might be a problem. And then we experienced it. So, <laughs> well, we you know, it's it. so interesting. I mean, there's so many ways I could take this comment. I mean, you know, fundamentally, when people ask that question, the flip side, to, I'll just take a second and say the flip mm -hmm. side is, you know, I do a lot of business coaching and, and I have people introduce themselves during that. And, and they'll often say, um, yeah, I have a boutique agency or I have a, a small agency. And I, and I say, you know, the word small or boutique um, as a modifier is really immaterial here, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. Can you do the work if you're going to go to a right. client? Yes. And then size has th that modifier adds no value. And in fact, I think it tells a little bit more about yourself. So I think it works the other way too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know, ego is the enemy, which is why you're kind of like glomming onto that metric of size as being something good. When in fact, it, as you said, you, you can have 2000 people to be unprofitable. It means nothing. Right. <laughs> as my, my, my CFO is very fond of saying to me, you know, revenue is for show, but profits are for dough. And, and it's, it's <laughs> very true. You know, it's very true. But, you know, you've talked uh, uh, about this evolution and, and there's an interesting thing that you said there between 50 and 75 and you, you may have hired people for their technical skills, but now you need people with management skills. Are you familiar with the, the Griner curve? Have you ever heard of that before? I have not. Yeah, well, Griner was a professor at Harvard Business School who back in the 70s did an analysis of the growth stages of companies. He looked at a whole bunch of companies and he started to try to figure out what the, uh, you know, if there are any commonalities between those companies and how they grow. Why well, I bring this up, and you can Google it, it's, it's all over the net. Well, I bring this up because a lot of these things are there, right? A lot of these things have already been thought through. And I know for us, it was really helpful to see that as we were kind of going through each one of those stages. And my question to you is, how did you make it through those stages for yourself? How did you say, okay, I've reached the stage and, and I know that it's not about size. Uh, I need to rethink how I'm doing things because I'm now going from 50 to 70. Rand told me about this and yep, I'm here. You know, we've put a lot of leadership training in place um, externally focus like some people people are going off site to work with some professional coaches uh, so everybody's kind of being leveled up from that perspective which has helped i mean that's taken you know uh, you know maybe six months to be put in place and to see some effect from um and then we've we've just changed the organization as well we've simplified a lot we used to have too many people reporting into several people right at the top now we've simplified that so one of our co-founders, Carter, he's now the president, and we have three business units, uh, revenue, operations, and uh, wow. Delivery? How did I? No, uh, it's, it's product. <laughs> Pro, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Product, uh, revenue, and operations. <laughs> and, and they all report to him. So now it's, it's a much simpler. By the way, Ollie, structure. that happens to me multiple times <laughs> on a daily basis. So no worries. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when I'm trying to describe our core values to someone and I forget one of them. Yeah, that, that's a great moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so uh, some of the things like that, we, we've restructured and it's made a lot of difference. And as we've learned, you know, people have come and go from the company and, we, and we've, we've hired people who have experience in organizational restructures and they've helped. So it's, it's been many things. But I think some of the things that can get you in trouble or when these things occur, like you mentioned a few there, a few more are... Uh, when you say you're small, you might have one floor in a building. When you move to two floors or three floors, that's a big change there because usually, and unless you do it in, in a certain way, like if you have it siloed where development sits on, your developers sit on five, uh, marketing and CS sits on four or, or something like that, then there's a big portion of the company because you don't work with them day to day, you're never going to see them. And you lose that personal connection and that can change the impact of how everybody works together and the impact on the company. So that's one of the biggest things I noticed when we, we grew. So we had to have more than one floor that created some of the harmful impact. And it makes sense because there's a lot of research about 
you know, the size of a group of people and how well they're able to remember and know all of the, the rest, you know, tribal, yeah. in tribal times. I think the number was 125. Uh, after that, you can't remember everybody or have a decent connection with everyone. Well, uh, what would be your next point? I think that if I'd known that, and I, I spent a lot of time as a public speaker now, it's my main part of my job. But if I'd known that that was going to be so important, because it's been the biggest, it's had the biggest positive impact on my personal and professional growth. It's I, I'm night and day from who I was uh, as a person, as a professional, as a marketer from, you know, four years ago when I started speaking to now. So if I'd known that, I may have embraced it earlier. I'm glad I didn't because the way it all has panned out is that I met my wife while I was speaking at a gig in Vegas and she was attending. So if anything <sighs> changed, that wouldn't have happened. <laughs> yeah, right. But knowing how important it was, uh, and if that wasn't the circumstance, then yeah, I would, I would probably tend to think that I wish I'd embraced it more uh, earlier on. Well, well, why did you not? I mean, what, if you, I'm, I'm assuming that you were offered speaking gigs and you're, are you saying that you turned them down? And, and if you did, why was that? And the flip question is, okay, wonderful news, super happy that you met your wife, but what are some of the other ancillary benefits that you feel you've gotten from uh, getting up on stage and speaking in public? The main reason I didn't uh, yeah, you're correct. I was asked all the time. So for the first five years of our company, I was a prolific writer and I, I tried to make my writing very entertaining. So I got a lot of requests to go speak at conferences. And honestly, I was very naive back then. I didn't know what the benefit of speaking at a conference was. I wasn't interested in conferences. I was like, why would you want to be a speaker? That's dumb. <laughs> yeah. I had no clue. Um, but the reason I didn't do it was because I'd been hiding behind a desk the whole time, hiding behind my screen, doing all this writing. And the only interaction you have really is on Twitter or in the comments of the blog post. Uh, so my biggest fear, and this is just classic imposter syndrome, my biggest fear was that I'd get on stage and at the end of my talk, if there was Q&A, there'd be a question thrown at me. And that question, that one question that terrified me was, how do you know? Why are you the person that knows this? Why am I paying money? Why should I listen to you? And I, I just thought I'd be in that moment, I'd freeze and I'd be like, I, you know, especially because I work with, you know, I work in the conversion kind of space. So everything's based on data and not everything can be right. I mean, part of being, you know, the term thought leader is that you have original thought, you come up with new things, you, you, you know, you do R and D you in, you invest in trying to make change and do things that are new. And that's what I always try and do. So there's always going to be a little bit of an element of, you know, well, I think this is a good idea. I will validate it as I go. Um, often I'll have lots of results, but not always. So that was my biggest fear. Um, but mm -hmm. on, now I've done about hundred gigs in the last four years and I've never been asked that question once. Yeah, uh, it was just a fear that was not realized. So interesting, you should say that. And and by the way, I appreciate your your authenticity about sharing that with our listeners because uh, I don't think you're the only person that has an imposter syndrome or, or feels that they don't really belong. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of here. I didn't know how that happened, but don't tell anybody. I don't want to be found out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but also, you know, getting up on stage and suddenly being the focus of attention. It's not that easy. And, and so have you felt that, you know, that it's improved your ability to just deliver a message to clients? Um, I know that Unbounce isn't an agency per se, but you do have product and you do have to communicate what the value proposition of that product is and or dealing with staff and, and motivating them. And what, what would be some of those spinoffs? Yeah, I think it's it's really helped because obviously as a speaker your entire job is communicating so it's definitely helped how i see the value of, of of clarity and being able to communicate properly and i try to bring that back to the work i do which hopefully influences others um, and i also do a lot of speaker coaching internally to try and help others in the company kind of level up their because uh, there's a lot of people that are interested in speaking and, you know, sometimes you just need someone to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Did you? Did you have somebody help you? 
No, I didn't. So where'd you, where'd you learn? I'm very obsessive and I just drilled really deep into how to be a, a public speaker. Um, I read that one of the books that influenced me most was how to deliver a Ted talk by Jeremy Donovan, which was fascinating. He analyzed mm. a lot of Ted talks and the, yeah. what is it that makes them work. And then my commute to work at the time, I used to jump on the bus and it took exactly 18 minutes to get to work, which is the length of a Ted talk. So I would watch Ted talks on my uh, phone and headphones on the way to work every day. So by the time I get to work, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to change the world. <laughs> Super yeah, pumped yeah. Yeah. You're inspired. I every day. Yeah. And then I just practiced a lot. Like I, I've written a few posts on medium about it. Uh, there's one, there's a few bit of adult language in it, but uh, if you search for it's okay to puke when you're a public speaker, okay. <laughs> that's, that's kind of my initial yeah. journey covered in that post. But yeah, I just obsessed over it and, and worked really hard. I I'd show up early when I travel so that I could go the day before, you know, go tread the boards kind of yeah. thing, speak to the organizers, the AV people. So I'd get on stage uh, just so I knew what it was like. So then when I'm practicing, I would visualize myself on stage so I'd know exactly where I'm going to walk, where I'm going to move my hands, everything I'm going to do. So it was all pre-visualized so that when I get up there, I had a little bit of familiarity. So, so interesting you should say that. You know, years ago, I... Uh was also making the decision that I want to get better at speaking. And I looked at what actors did mm -hmm. and what professional athletes do, and they do, they rehearse, they practice. And, and part of that is removing the unknown. So your point about getting up on stage and walking around is something that I've done all the time. And I, and it, you know, I really recommend that if you can get into the room, you're going to be giving a presentation. If you can get to the place, you're going to be giving a, a, a talk beforehand and by beforehand I, I you know preferably the night before so that you remove the unknown of the space the space doesn't become something unfamiliar it becomes something that you're aware of you know how you're going to move your body through that space you see where the lights in the stage is and and that becomes a lot more familiar so it, it enables your head to just be clearer and to be much more in the moment and of course, we've got our script and we know what we want to say and we've got our talking points and we've got our slides to help us along, but it's the ability to be in flow uh, and have that command that I think makes for a really compelling presentation. Definitely. And the more comfortable you are, the more likely you are and the, the more rehearsed or prepared, the more likely you are to ad lib. And right. that's when the magic happens. When you're Correct. on stage and you say things in the moment because you're, you're formulating new ideas as you go or you're reacting to the crowd or something you said, that's when the originality, the beauty, the, the constant learning comes from. And it's, it's amazing. Every time I get into that headspace where I just start riffing, I absolutely love it. And it only comes from being prepared. Well, I think that's the, the fundamental point. If you're loose and in the moment and able to, to react to the audience, then they'll have a really good time and so will you. Mm -hmm. What's your next point? What got us here won't get us there. Now, this oh, was a uh, great say, book. Yeah, Marshall Goldsmith. I, yeah. I didn't know who this was by. They said there was a guy in our office who in some town hall, some meeting, he said this and it resonated. And now, then for about six months after that, every time there was a, a main meeting in, in our main space, town hall or something else, it was just this recurring theme. People kept saying it in all that dialogue because it, it made a lot of sense. And for me as a marketer, what got us here, uh, we've always been content marketing focused and will continue to be. But the channels, the methods, the things we do in that are very different in terms of the impact they have. Uh, you know, we were we were amongst the group of the first doing content marketing, you know, a decade ago. So it was easier then to, if you were good at it, it was easier to stand out, easier to have a big impact. People showed up at webinars then. They, they don't really do that anymore. You know, infographics have come and gone. Sure, they still exist, but, you know, different channels can die. And you need to understand that that's going to be a thing because if you rely on them and then they dry up you're like oh what are we going to do now and you might figure it out 
but you're going to have a dip there until you figure it out. So the more you can recognize the fact that any channel or any new thing you try, there's a good chance it'll die and you should prepare something before it does. Uh, I mean, webinars were our biggest channel, acquisition channel, like 2012, 2013. There it was, you know, we'd have thousands of people, like 3,500 register, we'd have 800 people show up, 150, 200 of them would stay on for a demo at the end of the webinar that was product demo related to the topic of the webinar. So it just worked beautifully. But then because we're a generous, giving and transparent company, yeah. <laughs> we started writing about how to do a great, great webinar <laughs> and gave all of our secrets away. We also got some from friends that like Kissmetrics. And, you know, so we learned from others and then we developed our skills and how to do it. And then we shared it with everyone else. So which at that point, people start catching up and then you have to find a new way to innovate, a new different way of approaching it. Uh, what's the yeah. process that you use to think through what's the next thing? A uh, mixture of blind panic and... <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate the honesty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I mean, the advice comes from knowing. <laughs> right. But you're like, oh, this doesn't work anymore. Um, but when you start to see that the diminishing returns, you shouldn't stop doing it. That, that's one of the mistakes that we made was when it starts to not be quite as effective, uh, you stop it entirely. You shouldn't do that. You should keep doing it until you have something new and have to have that kind of transition period. Uh, because, and just adjust your expectations and the way you do it. Because, yeah, people don't show up to webinars because they want the recording. They don't, they don't want to show up because they maybe they can't attend, you know, and that's one of the tactics we used to use on the landing pages for registration, which had a big, big impact. It's like, oh, if you can't make it, sign up anyway, we'll send you the recording. It was a huge, that had a huge impact on the amount of registrations we got just with that one little line next to the CTA. And now that's just the kind of the way it is because people want on demand. But then if you have this video for them to watch and it's going to be about an hour long typically with most webinars they're not going to do it especially when there's no live engagement so i think we have to adjust how we present uh, our content so in that case maybe you still do it but then when you have the video chop it up into 15 pieces and use that everywhere to try and you know expand your reach as much as you can don't just limit it to the format that it, it came in use it somewhere else because the fundamentals don't really change, you know, the, the content w can work. And sometimes when you do an audit of your marketing, you're like, well, what's, what has worked? Well, that can't, that thing worked really well. Why didn't, because we did landing page sessions, which was a video series, 20 minute videos, 15, 20 minute, where I critique landing pages um, and whole campaigns. Then I jump into our, into the unbounced product and show people how I would go about changing the landing page. So it was compelling, it was interesting, and then it showed the product, which is the fundamental part. The key thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we never did a second season of that, which was kind of stupid because it was our highest performing campaign ever uh, because we'd done other things, but they didn't show the product. This one did. And, you know, sometimes you get caught up in, maybe it's because uh, people leave the company and they were the main champion of something or people get distracted or have a new idea. That's kind of the opposite where what got us here today in this moment continue to do uh, because some, you know, with content, people create and then let it die uh, rather than, you know, uh, following on, repeating, doing more of it. And video is so crucial now that when you have success with something like that, you, you know, you really need to keep doing it and focus yeah. on the fundamentals. That's what I've learned uh, writing 350 blog posts about landing pages. I got bored. That was when I kind of went to be a, a speaker and I stopped writing. I wrote a lot more this year. Uh, but one of the reasons was I was just bored of writing the same old stuff. So you try and seek out something new, a different thing, something different, different channel or different way of writing about something. And you forget that the, there are still, you know, thousands of people, thousands of marketers born every minute who are going to come up and have this same need for landing pages or whatever your product or service is. And if you don't continue to focus on the fundamentals for them, you're letting them down and they will get that foundational content 
from someone else right. because we have the best foundational content and landing pages, but a lot of it is old. So now it's starting to get outranked uh, or it's just not as high quality as it was back then. And if you don't realize that and you don't go back and optimize that old content and create new foundational content, that's when your competitors can swoop in and kind of take over that critical point where you're getting the new people to then grow with you as a brand because that's what you want you want people to succeed with you because then the, even if they're not using your product if they're learning from you and becoming a better marketer better whatever it is they are going to trust you and eventually either they'll become a customer or they'll point other people towards you so you have to be with your potential customers right from the start awesome can you share with us what your next point would be pricing pricing is very very complicated oh my gosh and and, uh, and uh, a subject of many podcasts too but yeah it's very interesting <laughs> what you have to say about this maybe i can learn something yeah it's about adjusting your pricing as you grow you know when you when you start it's very natural to undervalue yourself you're like oh, well is anyone ever going to pay for this uh so you tend to price below what you should um, when we started we have you know we're a SaaS product monthly recurring and we had ten dollar plans 25 and 50 and 99 i think the problems there are a you don't get as much money as you could uh, but more importantly you're pricing people who are not your ideal customer into your product and that's not good for anyone. It's not good for them because this isn't the solution for them, most likely. And it's not good for you because you'll have people, in our case, we want professional marketers with a budget. We don't want someone who wants to put a page on the internet yeah. <laughs> because they're not going to have an ad spend. They're not going to realize the ROI of using a landing page. They're not going to stick around. So they're going to impact our churn metrics and lifetime value metrics. So all these kind of things that an investor would look at or you know, down the road, if you're gonna look at an exit or raising money, anything you're doing, if you have unideal customers coming in, you will look less healthy, less attractive to them and your support costs go way up because you're constantly helping people who don't know what they're doing. And that's okay because they shouldn't be there in the first place. So it's okay that they don't understand that specific you know, marketing uh, strategy or problem, but you'll spend a lot of time dealing with them, educating. Yeah, and you know, I'll say that this point maps directly into service-based business as well. Many times when you're starting off, uh, you're going to be competing on price. We were talking with Ben West earlier on about when they started off and and how they start to grow the company at Intergalactic and then EventBase. And one of the things that he pointed out to is there's always going to be somebody that's going to be out to beat you on price because in this business, there's always a new kid that's got a great idea that's going to start selling services like, let's say, just uh, search ads from their basement. And so if you're competing on price, uh, that, that can just wipe out all margins and it's a race to the bottom pretty quickly. And similarly, uh, this idea about support costs on the on the kind of lower tier value clients is, you know, my experience has been consistently that the clients that pay the least generally consume the most with respect to client management costs and where your your challenges lie. And I'd be interested to hear if you, you found the same thing too in, in your business. We did, yeah. I mean, we had this, when we started out, we'd have this guy in his 70s called Lamar. He'd call up almost daily um, <laughs> and he'd spend an, over an hour on the phone because he was in that situation he had a grandkid who probably told him you need to be on the internet. So he ended up, you know, signing up with us and trying to create a landing page, not for the purposes of a marketing campaign, which is what they're for, uh, just for the sake of being on the internet. And he may have been lonely also. He was a nice guy, but he would suck up over an hour of our time almost every day. And if we would priced him out without trying to be mean, if we'd, you know, it would have been better for everyone. And so we've raised our prices several times as we've gone along. And every time our uh, revenue goes up. Uh, and, but always tied to value, right? So if you're raising price, it's not, yes. it's not, it's not just that you made the, 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 the product less functional. It's actually you've added value and increased the price point. 
Exactly. Yeah. You expand your product lineup, you expand the features, um, you, you put things in there that will give people a higher return, which then enables you to raise the prices because it makes sense. But it's interesting. Perception is crazy. So, you know, we're an established company now. We have a lot of big customers, uh, you know, Vimeo, New York Times, many I can't mention because we always yeah. seek permission to use their name. Um, and it's, I was at a conference, Marketing Profs uh, B2B Forum in Boston, right. and I was hanging out with Uberflip. Uh, they're from Toronto, and Hannah Abaza, she's now Shopify Plus, but she ran their marketing there. And we're hanging out, and she knows everybody. And this guy walks up and uh, starts chatting, and she introduces me, and, and said, this is Ollie from Unbounce. I said, oh, Unbounce, yeah, yeah, you guys are awesome. Yeah, yeah, uh, great product. And Hannah said, oh, you're a customer. He's like, nah, it's too cheap. None of my none of my managers would have, would approve it. It's too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Because the computer's you know, being enterprise. enterprise. Yeah, right. And we have enterprise customers, but because it's and we have higher touch uh, support options for them. But typically, it's a self serve product, and we we don't position ourselves as an ent- as enterprise software, even though we can be because we're rock solid. Our infrastructure is amazing. It's the best in the industry by far. But that if you do say so. Will, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard. I've heard. Uh, <laughs> uh, amongst yes, other yeah. um, if When they see that even though there are enterprise price plans, but you don't see the price on the website, when they see $99 a month or $199, they're like, oh, yeah. that, that must be yeah. a toy. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Funny how that how works. Huh? Work. Funny how that works. Yeah. Your next point would be what? This is connected to, you know, the content marketing kind of aspect. It's to show your product. It's a fundamental problem of content marketing in that people don't show their product. I mean, the the main tenet of content marketing is that you're educating people how to solve problems and that your product or service actually, you know, can help solve. So as they learn, they may become a customer. That's the, the, the fundamental concept. But if you don't show your product in some way along that path, you're missing a big opportunity. And I don't mean, you know, just putting banners everywhere or trying to put screenshots of your software where it's not relevant. That's not going to work. I mean, I do a lot of experimentation on a blog. Sidebars, nobody clicks on the banners there. Nobody clicks on your CTA at your bottom of the page. The way people interact with content is changing. And assuming people will click on something because you're asking them to is naive. And one of the problems in blog designs is that and I've done a lot of experimentation here. If you take your average SaaS blog, so you can look at ours, look at MailChimp, HubSpot, anyone. If you cover up the entire page when, you're, when there's a blog post, just look at the navigation. There's a very good chance it doesn't mention what your product is at all. Not once. You'd have to drill down into the navigation to find it. It'll probably say, products, uh, features, pricing, blog, partners, blah, 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 which is relevant to someone reading your content. Uh, so you have to add some context there. Now we've redesigned ours and at the top on the blog, it's a different header for the blog and it just has who we are, value prop, and then there's a call to action for each of the three products. So instant product awareness, A, we have three products, not just one anymore, and you can see what they are. And it's had a big impact on the amount of people interacting with them from that content so so ollie that's i'm just going to interrupt because yeah. our listeners are largely in an agency space and I, I love what you're saying here which is you exist to sell a product make sure that product is properly featured don't be shy about it if people are there it's because they have an interest in it be open and clear and and don't make them think yeah. <laughs> i think it's the title of the book that being said what about in the service business because your product is pretty straightforward right mm-hmm. there's like different tiers of it but it's pretty straightforward if you're in a service-based business how might this map to that do you think yeah it's very very similar uh, so in a product you will have different features of the product different benefits and different use cases and it's the use case part that is really interesting. So in your service, you probably have many services. You offer this, you offer this, you offer this. You can package those up in different ways. Um, I'll illustrate it simply with some product stuff, but it transfers. If you take, we have sticky bars as a product. If you take that 
and then you add some uh, cookie targeting, you can create a bar at the bottom of the page that is a cookie law bar, which is you need for the EU, also GDPR. Uh, mm -hmm. So when people arrive, you know, oh, we use cookies, blah, blah, blah. That's not necessarily what people might imagine to use the tool for. It's just a different use case. So similarly with your services, you can take different parts of different services, rebrand them as a new service, and offer that because your customers can't always imagine the use cases and the different ways that they can leverage your product or your services. So if you have to do a bit of the creative thinking there and package up different things, it also allows you to see which things resonate most because potentially a little bit of this and a little bit of that is way more interesting than what you think just giving this is. Well, uh, Ollie, that's been really, really great. I mean, that was a really fun conversation to have, and I, you really shared a lot with our listeners. I want to just say thank you so much for that. If our listeners wanted to connect with you uh, to discuss anything that you might have raised during the, the course of the podcast or other things related to Unbounce, how might they do so? Well, thanks for having me on, Alex. Yeah, uh, the simplest way, fastest way will be on Twitter. Uh, Ollie Gardner is my handle. That's a, a quick way, but I'm also very open and approachable. So if you want to email me, it's just ollie at unbounce.com. That's very, very uh, generous of you. So to our listeners, I want to say thank you again for listening to the podcast. Uh, if you want to catch our back catalog, you can. It's available on SoundCloud. We have a YouTube channel. Of course, it's on iTunes, Google Play Music, and Stitcher. And if you like the podcast, I encourage you to leave comments, write a review, share it with friends. And if you have any questions for me or comments that you'd like to have me look into for a future guest, send me a note. Uh, my Twitter handle is A Langshire. And as always, I hope you join us for our next podcast. We'll ask our guests what would be the top five things that they wish they'd known. Mm -hmm.